Hello and welcome to another episode of Bare Bones Wargaming, a show with no bells, no whistles, no frills, just a man, a camera, and his game. Today's episode, we are finishing out 2018 here, not too many days left in the year, this being the 26th day of December, with um, a list of games that on Board Game Geek, uh, someone asked what's the 10 best new to you games, not necessarily games that were new in 2018, but new to you, even if it was, you know, something that was first published in the 1980s, and also 10 worst to you. So what I thought I'd do is, just to round out the year, is to share those games with you here, my 10 best new to you games of the year, and also then I'll talk about the ones that I didn't care for a whole lot this year, which there actually aren't 10, it's a much shorter List. Now, spoiler alert here, some of these games I've already talked about before, but this will be kind of a nice synopsis for those of you who um, maybe did not or have not watched some of the other videos that I have done so far this year. This will give you a chance to kind of look at those, and then of course the ones that didn't make uh, my top ten list of best new ones to me, um, those ones of course... I really didn't do videos on for, well, reasons I'm sure are obvious, okay? So, here we go. Let's get started here. So, 10 best. Number 10. Hitler's Right by GMT Games, uh, designed by Mark McLaughlin and Fred Schachter. Uh, I know this game has had issues. Uh, that's kind of a bit of an understatement, especially with the rule book. Uh, but there has been great support for the game. Both a designer answering things. There's a great intro tutorial a video on Board Game Geek that I mentioned um, in my other video before. And quite frankly, the game is quick, it's light, it's fun. It's a very playable World War II game. That, you know, as you can see there, area spaces and such. Uh, the cards, once you get used to the symbols and, and figure out exactly what they mean. Uh, the game actually is quite a bit of fun. It is, a, it is a good game to play. Now, of course, you have to keep in mind, as the game implies here, this is Hitler's Reich. So this doesn't start until 1941. This is after France has fallen, but before Barbarossa begins. So some folks were thrown off by that a little bit when they first uh, got it and saw it. Or if they didn't realize, they are like, whoa, wait a minute, hold on, this thing starts in, in 41. It does. The solitaire rules for it. Uh, there's two of them. There's a two-handed way of playing, which is the way that I enjoy playing, and there's also the bot. I wasn't a big fan of the bot, but um, playing it the two-handed way, which again, they go through in the rule book and stuff, actually worked out very well. So it, it, um, it flowed nicely, and it was a very fun game to do. And if you want more detail on it, I made three videos on it. Yeah, and you can take a look under uh, my video playlist for this. But this was this was number 10 for me. This I did enjoy this. This this took a little bit at first to getting used to, but um you know it's kinda of like the first time you have a beer. You know, it's kinda of a little bitter and stuff and you're like, ooh huh. but you know after you get used to it a little bit, you're like, hmm, it's pretty good man. So let's go and look at Hitler's Reich. It's kinda of like a beer. So Hitler's Reich for me was number ten. Coming in at number nine new games to me this year is Wing and a Prayer. Okay, uh, This is from Lock and Load Publishing. This is designed by... Oh, see if the designer's name is on here somewhere. I don't see it. Oh, that's unfortunate. Yeah, I really don't see it. I forget who is the designer of this, to be honest. I'm not going to lie to you. So, this game, though, I liked because it kind of filled a gap as far as playing goes for me. Because on the one hand, you have games like B-17 Queen of the Sky slash Target for Today, which Target for Today is basically just B-17 revamped and reloaded, if you will, and refined. Uh, and then, of course, there is B-17 Flying Fortress Leader from DVG Games, Dan Versen Games, which is more where you're in charge of whole squadrons. This one here, you're basically in charge of one squadron of bombers that you can fly up to 12 of them at a time, depending on you know, who's serviceable, who isn't, and all that stuff and things. This is a point-to-point -point map, as you can see here by the cover. 
Okay, uh, and it is a lot of fun. It plays pretty quick. The production values could be a little better. Uh, I did find some things to be a little uh, flimsy, uh, quite frankly. But overall, I really enjoy the game. It is kind of like a, it is, it's just a nice um, in-between game. It's not necessarily a big uh, strategic game like B-17 Flying Fortress Leader, which also takes into account what goes on on the Russian front and the North African front. But it's not as small and tactical as Target for Today, which of course is just one plane, you and your you know, nine of your closest, newest friends, you know, flying over the Third Reich and, you know, you're, um, you know, in the Memphis Bell, if you will, okay? This one's a little different than that, uh, but I enjoyed it. It's nice, quick, easy, um, it's a lot of fun. If you like air warfare games, uh, I do recommend it, but it's... It's not real heavy and it's not real detailed, I guess is what I'm trying to say. But it was a good game. I enjoyed it as far as an Air Warfare game went this year. So that's number nine. Now, number eight. <clears throat> number eight here I'm going to talk about very briefly because I know most of you subscribe here are war gamers. And this is not a war game. Which, it's true. It isn't. Okay. But this one came out late in the year. Um, if you're of the same age group that I am... You probably remember this. This came out when I was in my early days in college. Batman the Animated Series. I own the whole series. And Batman's been a favorite of mine ever since I was a wee lad. You know, my two favorite comic book characters are Batman and Spider-Man. And depending on which day of the week it is, if you were to ask me, hey, you know, Tim, list your top five comic book characters, uh, Batman might be first, Spider-Man might be first. It really, it, it kind of fluctuates. It really, really, really does, you know, uh, as far as, as who's the best. Now... For those of you curious, once you get past the top two, my top five favorite comic book characters after that is, well, number three is Hellboy, because I find Hellboy's stories to be very interesting, and I also love the idea of uh, the story aligned that, you know, you're not fated to be something. You know, Hellboy, his whole background and stuff, you know, he, he literally came from the nether regions. But, you know, he didn't want to go along with that, the embracing the evil and the nastiness and stuff. So I like that idea. It's just the fact that, you know, <laughs> you're not, you, 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 there's no fate except what we make, so to speak. Not to, you know, sound too, maybe do a Terminator 2-ish, but, you know, I like that. And then my fourth and fifth favorite characters are Wolverine, because um, I just like Wolverine. I, I think, you know. I think he's a cool and complex character. And then Nightcrawler's my, my fifth one there. But this is a lot of fun, getting back to the game. This is a lot of fun. This can be played co-op, uh, but also can be played solo as well. And it really is a blast. The board is a little weird. You get um, buildings, and the buildings are not exactly the firmest in the world. But there's a lot going on here, a lot more than might meet the eye. Uh, so if you like, you know, if you're looking for a non-war game, quite frankly, to play and you do like Batman, I would check this out. Uh, each game plays a little different. There's some good fan support online where they did some extra masterminds and stuff uh, that don't necessarily come in the base game. So it's a lot of fun. It, it's very challenging. And it is, uh, it is a good co-op game. But it also is fun solo. I played it solo playing two and three characters because basically you can play Batman, Robin, Batgirl, and uh, Catwoman and then the Gotham Police Force, headed by, of course, Commissioner Gordon, uh, is the characters you can play in the game and such. So this one I did have a lot of fun with. I did enjoy this a lot. Uh, this was a good, pleasant, light surprise. You know, when I want to take a break from, from fighting this, that, and the next thing, uh, this, this was a good choice. So that's number eight. Number seven on my list this year is the first Cold War game that I've had a lot of fun with in recent memory, and that is NATO Air Commander, uh, designed by Brad Smith, and this is from Holland Spiel. This is one of my first Holland Spiel games I've ever had, and this is a very slick design. It integrates both the air aspect, which is the focus, but there's also the land campaign that's involved too. So while you're desperately trying to get control of the air space over top of Germany, where of course is the most likely place that the Cold War would have went hot, you're also dealing with the advancing Warsaw Pact forces. You know, can you slow that down? Can you uh, not only grapple for supremacy in the air, but hold back the massive um, Soviet hordes as they rush westward trying to make Britain an island off the of Soviet Sea? So, 
Now this was a lot of fun. This is a diceless system, which is also cool uh, as well. But this one I, I, I was pleasantly surprised by. And Holland Spiel, the quality and the, the components and stuff I enjoyed as well too. So again, this is the first time I bought one of their games this year. Uh, and again, I did a video on this if you'd like to see more detail. Uh, you can check that. So that was number seven. Number six is a game that I just stumbled across by accident. But boy am I glad I did. And it is Victory and Glory. As you can see, this box is huge. Okay, Victory and Glory Napoleon by Glenn Drover. Now, of course, one of the things I've always looked for for a long, long time is a strategic Napoleonic game. And it's been hard to find one, quite frankly. But this game, this game really... Well, I should just, let me back up. Hard to find one without getting bogged down in a whole lot of, of detail and stuff. This one gives you the whole feel of the Napoleonic Wars. But it plays very quick, very light. Uh, but at the same time, it's it's simple, but not simplistic. Okay, there's a lot going on here, as you can see from this map, which the map is gigantic, by the way. It would basically, um, again, I've done a video on this, so if you're curious, you can see more of the gameplay there. But at the same time that you're trying to plan military campaigns, you can see the military units here. You also are trying to keep your economy running which of course is going to impact your military uh, capabilities and then also diplomacy you know you score points for each each of these of the countries in play like Russia and Poland and such uh, as each little for lack of a better way to put it like mini epoch like in history of the world after so many turns after each three turns you resolve it and stuff but this is the kind of game that a non war gamer would really enjoy too and as a hardcore war gamer of you know, I've been doing wargaming now about 30 years. This was a very pleasant surprise to me. The combat system is diceless and cardless, so keep that in mind. It is uh, it is interesting. It is straightforward, and yet it's not. Uh, there's a lot of things you can do here with this, some bluffing and stuff. And again, the card play, you get the cards every turn, and you have to make your decisions. And this is, is also neat because it's at the grand strategy level, and it's very intricate, but without being super complicated. So I was very, very pleased with this. This was one of my big um, ABBA games of the year. Now, what I mean by that is, you know, if, if you know anything about the rock group ABBA, they had a lot of hits, but one of my favorite songs of theirs was, If You Change Your Mind, and Take a Chance on Me. Uh, and I took a chance on this, and I'm glad I did, because this was a bit of a gamble. This was a bit of throw of the dice. And, you know, this came up, you know, on, on a roll of needing a 6 on a 1d6 to me, this came up a 6. So this this was a lot of fun. And again, if you want to see more detail, I do have a video about it. So, that is game number 6. Number 5. The number 5 game for me, new game for this year. And again, this will come as no shocker I've done a video on is Pavlov's House. Pavlov's House, done by DVG Games, um, designed by David Thompson. This game also was a very pleasant surprise, because I'm not much of a tactical gamer, so this is why I passed on this when I heard about it at first. I was like, yeah, I'm not really into tactical games. Tactical games just, you know, they're not my cup of tea. They're not my thing. All right. So I passed on this at first, but... When I started really looking at it more carefully, and I forget what caught my attention, there was something, or maybe a comment by somebody on Board Game Geek whose opinion I, uh, I value, I mentioned something. When I started to dig into it and found out that there was both the tactical component, as you can see here with Pavlov's house, but then there's also the operational component over here where you're trying to get supplies across the Volga and communications and keep your headquarters intact. Then that really, really caught my attention, okay? And it's designed to play solitaire, which is very cool. Um, yes, the Black Buzzards, if you've read uh, Sergeant Rock, you know what I'm talking about here. Um, these, uh, the German Air Force is just brutal. I still need to read Stopped at Stalingrad, because I, this game really opened my eyes to just how how powerfully brutal the German Air Force was at Stalingrad. I don't think I realized just how nasty it was. And, of course, now I want to read up more about it. So, again, uh, stopped at Stalingrad by... Um, oh, bear with me here. It's right over here on my East Front game shelf. Stopped at Stalingrad by... Uh, Joel Hayward. Joel Hayward is the Stopped at Stalingrad book. Uh, is a book that's been on my shelf that uh, I'm looking forward to reading. But this was really a lot of fun. And again, 
This one you can play in two different ways. There's a base game, there's a more challenging game where the, the Germans actually with an AI system do some tactical things. So this, if you like the Eastern Front and you like um, those kind of, um, it's not quite one of the leader games, I wouldn't go so far as to say that, but kind of a DVG style of game, I would definitely look into this. They're doing another one too called Castle Something. Uh, but again, it's, it's just not quite my cup of tea, so I really didn't look to see what it was by the same designer. But um, I'd love to see him do one on Wake Island, because that would be really cool. He was asking, uh, David Thompson was asking the other day about suggestions on Board Game Geek. You can track that thread down if you like. But uh, Wake Island would be really cool, because there's the possibility of, you know, the ill-fated um, relief attempt that the U.S. was going to do with a couple of aircraft carriers. And that would make, for me, a very interesting option in a game like this. Um, like, um, it's not quite against the odds. Well, it's not quite States of Siege. It's not, it's not, it's not that. This is much more intricate, much more complicated, much more enjoyable. But it, it is very much that. Um, against the odds, under siege, you know, Katie bar the door kind of mentality. And again, I've done a couple videos on this. You can check that out for more detail if you like. Now, my number four game this year was... One of the first card-driven games I've enjoyed in a while, Europe and Turmoil, done by Compass Games, designed by Chris Van Buren. This game is basically uses elements of Twilight Struggle and um, oh, 1989, and it's pre-World War I, with all the maneuvering that went on, and basically it posits two sides, authoritarian and democratic, which... Um, has been a subject of discussion whether you really could do that or not. Uh, but I found the gameplay to be a lot of fun. I also found it to be really good because you could incorporate um, the Great War. You know, you can trigger the Great War off and then, you know, get the results. And there's two different ways to do it. You know, uh, there's a more complicated one and then there's one that's you know, card-driven, basically. So this game, again, was a lot of fun, a lot of tension. I'm not a big World War One gamer. But I really enjoyed this, and this is one of the first card-driven games I've enjoyed in quite a while. Um, and one of the first ones I've purchased in quite a while, quite frankly, too. So, this was really good. If you like World War One, the pre-World War One stuff, check this out. And again, you know, I've got videos on that if you would like to see. Number three on my list. Now, this is our controversial choice. <gasps> dun, dun, dun! And this one is Stalingrad, Inferno on the Volga, um, by Vento Nuevo Games. Now, this game, people seem to either really like it or really dislike it. I like it, obviously. It's my number three new game of 2018. So, this one is a block game, but don't get the wrong idea about this game. This is not Turning Point Stalingrad with blocks. This is very, very different. This is, to me, and I've mentioned this before, this is, to me, basically a very good what-if game. You know, the German original plan was was not to get involved in Stalingrad as much as they did. Uh, basically, take it on the fly, secure your flank, and then drive down for the oil fields kind of thing. So, that's what this game is. You know, you don't necessarily get the reinforcements that you got historically. You know, there is no timetable for that kind of thing. Uh, this, the AI system, which runs the Soviets, to me, does a very good job because basically what did the Soviets do in Stalingrad? They dug in and basically bled the Germans as much as they could and they launched timely counterattacks, which is what the AI does in this system here, okay? Uh, through basically the rules and also through the cards that are involved. Now, the cards are a ticking time bomb in this game. You know, uh, there's a lot of pressure going on here as you try to capture the spawning hexes, which are the critical hexes in Stalingrad to secure the city. And then, of course, if you get to the dreaded OKH card, and where OKH is basically like, dude, you got to capture all the riverbank hexes. You're like, what? You know how many hexes on army? It's 17, 19, one of those two. 19 hexes, maybe, all together. It's like, man, come on. But this I enjoyed a lot. I had a lot of fun with. I played this. I think I actually have all the games on this list this year. This was the one I think I played the most. Uh, I think I played this eight or nine times. But this is a blast. This is a lot of fun. But again, it, 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 you have to just be aware when you when you go into it. It's it's not your father's Stalingrad game. Okay, for lack of a better way to articulate, this is a little different animal. 
but it's one that I enjoyed. It's one that I had a lot of fun with. It's one that, unlike other Stalingrad games to me, I don't feel it's so scripted. I don't feel it's like, um, oh, I don't feel like it's so much, you know, for lack of a better way to articulate it, to me, other Stalingrad games, and this is just my opinion, but they feel to me at some point that it's like World War One, where you're just basically beating on each other and trying to bleed each other to death. This one still feels like there's stuff you can do. There's maneuvering you can do and stuff. Uh, there are options here. And that, again, is just my personal opinion. But I really enjoy this game. This was my number three um, favorite game new to me this year. Number two. Now, number two is the oldest game on this list. Chronologically. And that's Fire in the Sky, which came out back in 2005, if I remember, from Multiman Publishing. This game is one of those games that, boy, this takes a lot to wrap your head around. This is not an easy game to get, okay? But there has been decent support. I myself have made some videos to try and help some folks who also might be on the fence about the game, whether they want to try it or not. Uh, I got a lot of help from Wiff Wendell. Uh, who's a member of Board Game Geek, who answered a lot of my questions as I wrapped my head around this, and that was a big help. So, you know, I appreciate his assistance um, in that sense. And this, to me now, is my go-to game for the Pacific Theater. Uh, I really, really enjoy this game. It is um, fairly involved, though. Now, I say that because next month here, hopefully, um, well, sometime next week, if I'm not mistaken, yeah, next week, uh, Pacific Tide should be published by Compass Games, which I've been looking forward to big time as well. Um, partly because I've just really have enjoyed Pacific Theater games the last couple of years. Partly because the system itself, if it's a good one, then I um, there's an one called Ostkrieg about the Eastern Front that I would be interested in picking up. But this one here, this this is this is really good. I've really enjoyed this. This is a playable Pacific game. Now I say playable because you know, the number of counters, the number of space you need. Once you get the system wrapped around your head, it's great. Now, my favorite Pacific Theater game still is Across the Pacific, which I know some people have asked me to do videos for and stuff, and I just haven't got around to because it's so big. It's so involved. And... But it's still... It's one I still pull out every once in a while, and mostly because of the chit pull. The designer of that game, uh, his name, oh, Michael Myers. <laughs> yeah, really. <laughs> um, he really did a nice job of doing two different chit pull systems, one strategic, one operational. So quite frankly, what you can do in the game is you can do Lady Golf. If you want to, as a Japanese, you can try to set it up, and you can try to pull it off. And it is theoretically possible. Which, to me, you know, games like that that can pull off things that are difficult to recreate, like the Inchon Landing or like um, Jackson's Flank March at Chancellorsville, those, to me, are really, really well-designed games. But it's so big. It is definitely a monster game. And this is not... And this is a lot of fun. So, again, if you've been thinking about this, and I understand it's supposed to be reprinted, I believe, this year... Uh, if you've been thinking about this game, take a look at my videos. Uh, I made several of them to kind of, again, help folks. Because, you know, it's part of the reason why I do my channel is to, you know, teach and help folks learn the games and decide if they want them or not. But this, this was my number two new-to-me game of this year because it was just, it was cool. And brrr, number one, not to sound like Casey Kasem, number one on our list for the sixth consecutive week. Sorry, that was a bad Casey Kasem impression. But for me, for 2018, number one, hands down, was Cataclysm. Easily my favorite game of this year. Designed by William Teroslavich, I hope I got that right, and Scott Muldoon. This game is the game I have been waiting my gamer life for on World War II in terms of sandbox element. In terms of starting in 1933 and being able to go and look at what would have happened if you know Japan had attacked the Soviet Union and focused on that instead of focusing on um, you know the Pacific which of course you know they were after the resources I get all that but 
you know, it is interesting, like, what if? What if they'd have put more emphasis into China and basically, you know, continued to play nice with the U.S. long enough to get the resources? Uh, there's also a scenario in the game that posits, you know, a fascist France, which is interesting, which then Italy uh, kind of moves closer to the U.K. So the geopolitics of that is interesting. It's a nice grand strategy system, as you can see here. And again, I did videos on this, and there's a lot of support for this game. This game was well-received this year, uh, very enthusiastically by the wargaming community. But, you know, the, the the units are huge. You know, their whole fleets, their whole armies. Uh, so it really lets you focus on the geopolitical strategy. Uh, you also have to take into account your stability and home front and economics and everything and stuff. So it is it's just a wonderfully designed thing, designed system. It is it is different, so it does take some work to wrap your head around. But overall, I think the rule book is well done. Um, I think that... It's explained pretty well. I think the support has been phenomenal um, by Scott Muldoon in particular. But this game just, it is the ultimate sandbox game. There is just so much you can do with this time period that it's just totally cool. I love it, love it, love it. It's on my table right now. That's why we're on the white table, by the way, instead of the brown table, because the white table is currently occupied, if you will. Okay? So, Cataclysm. Number one, and again, if you... One, you can go ahead and check out my videos I did for it. I also did a written review of this as well. All right. Now, from good to not so good for this year. Now, I didn't have ten games. I only had four. Because generally speaking, um, most of the time, most games I run across are games that I don't really dislike when I get them. Every once in a while, you'll come across a, a big lemon, like in the Four Roads to Moscow uh, game package, the Strike the Bear. Oh, what in the world? If you want to know more about that, go to Board Game Geek. I did a mega review of all four games of Four Roads to Moscow, um, published in uh, Against the Odds quarterly, or their annual, annual rather. I'm sorry, not quarterly, annual. And oh, 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 that was a. How should I put it? That game is a train wreck with a dumpster fire on board. That's the best way I can think to put that. Okay. Most of these games that I'm going to highlight here now, I don't feel quite as strongly about, but um, yeah, there's, um, yeah, well, let me just share with you, you know, what I didn't like about these games. Now, some of these games, of course, other folks have also uh, been less than enthusiastic about, but so let's just go ahead and let's get started here with that being said. So my number four, because I only had four of these, was Stalin's War. Um, this was done by GMT Games a while back. I didn't actually buy this. I traded for it because I'm such an East Front gamer. I love the East Front. I have like 50 to 75 of my games in my collection. And my collection of like pushing 600 games now are East Front games. So in Ted Ray series, a designer I like. You know, um, well, I take, you know what, let me step back for a second. He's kind of hit and miss for me. When I like him, I really like him. Like, say, Reds. You know, Reds I enjoyed. I really, really wanted to like the Dark Valley, but there's like a billion counters, and I, I just don't have the patience at my age, 46, to do that anymore. I just, I just can't. So, you know, yeah. So this, of course, you know, this was kind of a hybrid game of hexes. And card driven, which again is kind of like Mark Herman's Empire of the Sun, but Mark Herman's Empire of the Sun is much better. Too complicated for me still, but this one I just I, it didn't catch me, it didn't hook me, and I really didn't like the flow of it. I I, I didn't enjoy the East Front experience compared to other East Front games that I've had. So that um, that being said, um, you know this might be something that you might enjoy. But it just really, it really wasn't for me. I just felt like this combo of the hexes and the cards just, it just didn't, you know, round round peg in the square hole kind of thing. It just, it just didn't work for me. And, and, and I'm glad I traded for it. You know, kind of like, um, you know, Haywood Banks, the music's too loud. If you know anything about him, he's, he's a great, in my opinion, he's a great comedian, does a lot of songs and stuff. And there's a song he does called The Music's Too Loud. And talking about, you know, rock concert and stuff like that. And at one point, he's like, I'm glad I won these tickets. So I'm glad I traded for this. Because I'm glad I tried it finally. But, yeah, just... 
yeah, it just, it didn't, it didn't do it. It just didn't do it for me. Um, but again, I'm not saying that, you know, this game's broken. It's, you know, you know, not, not to, not to sound like, you know, some kind of, not to sound like the extras or something, but, um, yeah, it's not like that. It just, I just didn't like the combo. Just, just didn't like the combo. So, it just didn't fit together well for me. My number three game. Now, this one I just have to show you a picture of because I traded this game. I can't remember what I traded it for, though. And, again, since I've been looking for Pacific games, this is the Pacific War from Pearl Harbor to the Philippines. Um, lock and Load Publishing. Um, I, this game was okay, but the reason I really didn't like this game, to put it simply, because I don't have any visual here for you at all, as you can see. But the reason I really didn't like this game was basically because it felt like victory in the Pacific on steroids to me. And that's just, again, just my opinion. But it, it, it's, you know, if I, if I want to play a game like that, I'd play victory in the Pacific, which is a classic game. It's not so much my cup of tea anymore either, but, um, you know, it's, uh, it's just, it just didn't have the more complex feel that I was looking for, I guess. You know, it's, it's definitely nowhere near you know, fire in the sky. But I was looking for something that was a little simpler, which is part of the reason why I pre-ordered Pacific Tide, because I'm kind of hoping that Pacific Tide is going to be like that. It's going to be a little less complicated than fire in the sky and also be fun and enjoyable. And, and Greg Smith, who designed Pacific Tide, uh, I've enjoyed his his um, Hunters series as well, too. So I'm hopeful uh, um, for that as well, too. So again, that, that game just, it just wasn't, what I was looking for. It, it, you know, it just wasn't, it wasn't the game that I wanted on the Pacific Theater. Uh, the game in and of itself, again, if you like Victory in the Pacific and you're looking for something a little more complicated along those lines, you might want to check that out. That might be your cup of tea. All right, now we get to the top two. And let me just start this off here by saying, wow, wow, wowie, 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 wow. Ho, ho, ho. Um, this is the one of the War of the Worlds games. There was actually four of them. Um, England, France, Japan, and the U.S. That was done by DVG Games earlier this year. I have always loved War of the Worlds. Um, I wasn't a big fan of the 2005 movie. I enjoy the classic 1953 movie, quite frankly. But, you know, I read this when I was, oh, sixth grade, seventh grade, something like that I read, which, of course, was tough sledding. You know, if you know anything about H.G. Wells, some of his novels are, are fairly easy to read, and other ones are, you know, you better pack a lunch kind of thing. But this game, whew, this game has some issues. Um, there's problems for me, a lot of them. A lot of, you know, things with the waves and stuff, about how the Martians manifest themselves. You know, the Martians, if you know anything about the story, come down in cylinders, they assemble the machines, and they move out and stuff. That, in this game, it's like abracadabra, they magically show up. You know, there's like waves, it's like, you know, it's supposed to be, you know, like, oh, well, Recon in, you know, the late 1800s was not as good. Well, I'm not, I'm sorry, I'm not buying that. That doesn't stick with the core story. Um, yeah, it's just, you know, it's like, well, where do they come from? You know, is it, again, is it like... It just feels gamey, for lack of a better way to put it, okay? And it really can make... It makes things complicated because all of a sudden you have these ones show up and then it really messes with the sequence of play and it's just... Whew. Um, yeah, I tried the Japan game too because I, I was so... I'm so into this topic that I went for on Kickstarter the World Commander thing and I pledged for all four because you can play them together. And, oh, oh, that was probably one of the biggest gaming mistakes I had made in recent years. Because um, I tried the Japan one, and the Japan was more of the same of this, just lighter. And part of the problem is, to me, as I described on Board Game Geek, this is like playing the Russians in an East Front game in 1941-42 with no hope of 43. You know, nobody likes to be a punching bag forever. And I get it. I mean, I understand. You know, the technology, the tripods were just brutal, you know, um, compared to the technology of the day. But uh, to compare, 
Okay, Islands of the Damned, which I also did a video on this year. It's one of my favorite uh, magazine games of all time. You know, Wake Island, you know you're not going to win that thing. You know you're not. I mean, you know, you know the Japanese are going to come back with their second way. You know that they're going to come and kick butt and take names. But it's the thrill of... How long can I hold out? How, you know, getting those little, little victories. And that was the problem with this game. I didn't feel like there was enough little victories. You know, there was no, not enough of those little stick it, you know. Um, you know, like, um, like if you're a caveman, you know, fighting, a, 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 what's the word, a saber-toothed tiger. You know, there's no, like, those little victories where you jab, 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 and you nail the little bugger, even though you're like, dude, this thing's got huge teeth, it's got huge claws, it won't kill me. But it's like, eh, eh, eh. you never got any of those moments. Here, it was kind of like, mm, 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 and, and nothing was happening. It was like, hey, hey, you know, it's a, rather than, ah, uh, uh, gotcha, ha, 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 got one of those ones there, slowed you guys down there, because, you know, the germs are coming, the germs are coming, the germ. there was none of that, and I just was really, really, really super disappointed um, in this game and in the games in the series. Now, granted, I will say as a caveat, in all fairness, I have not tried the England game, which I've seen people say actually is the best of the group. And I haven't tried the, the France game. But um, at this point, I was so disappointed. And there's so many other games to play that I just, I never took the time. I didn't want to take the time. So, yeah. That, um, yeah. It's just, um, the other problem is the rule book. The rule book. Right away when this thing came out, there's people, and you can go check this out for yourself if you don't believe me on Board Game Geek, that were jumping on with questions and stuff because... Unfortunately, I'm going to be honest here, brutally honest, is DVG's rule books have been very poor in recent memory. Um, except, except, notable exception, Pavlov's House. Pavlov's House was a really well-written, put-together rule book. But like this, uh, like Corsair Leader, which I pledged for and also got this year, also was, you know, it's there's there's so many things missing. From it, um, there's a huge thread on Board Game Geek, so it's just, in my opinion, it feels like DVG games have slipped a little bit in the last year or so. That's just my personal opinion um, about what I'm seeing from them, and my disappointment with this, especially, but also I was, I was kind of disappointed with Corsair Leader too. Um, leaves me wondering if I'm going to buy any more of their games. On the other hand, if you know it's games that are being designed by David Thompson, who did Pavlov's House, I, I may look into that. I still can't decide what to do about that castle game, because it's just not a topic that grabs me. But, on the other hand, Pavlov's House was a lot of fun. So, we'll see. But this is my number two game this, that just really, yeah, it just, yeah, wow. I would not recommend that to anybody, quite frankly. And the last game, my number one game, that was new to me this year that I did not care for is a game you may not even have heard of called Panzer Attack. This is supposed to be a deck building game dealing with the Eastern Front. Now again, I am such an East Front guy that when I heard about this, I like deck builders. Uh, I have Legendary. Um, well, I guess Legendary is the big deck builder I have, but I also have Hands in the Sea. This though, um, this game really has has a lot of issues and fell flat for me. I mean, there's pluses here too, but there's also a lot of minuses as well. You know, um, on the plus side, as I'll show you here in a second, on the plus side of this game, the cards are pretty nice. They really are nicely designed. They look good. Uh, let me just give you a sample here of a few. You know. So here, I'll zoom in on these guys, because I want you to see what I'm talking about here. I mean, these are really nicely done. The artwork is nice. Um, you know, it, the information is organized clearly, although there's quite a few of it with hard and soft topics. Anti-air value, which... Uh, whoops, sorry, there we go. Which I question a little bit. Um, but, you know, again... That's, well, again, you know, this is my perspective on things. I mean, this, this, my whole channel is just my perspective on things. But the fact that the game 
comes down to comparing numbers, defense values versus hard and soft attack values, and that's how you resolve combat. That really kind of catches me the wrong way. It really sticks to my caw because there's so much friction in warfare that I just don't understand how you can do that. You know, other games and stuff, you have odds and things, but you resolve it with a die and stuff. You know, the, the, the chance element to it. This game does not have chance elements to it. I guess you could argue it does, depending on what you have in your hand, but that's another problem, too. You know, there's no... Um, there's no well-organized time frame here, unless you... I mean, you could, I guess, select cards that are limited to 1941 and stuff. But if you just play the game straight up, I mean, you know, you could have a Joseph Stalin tank up against a, you know, uh, 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 the Czech 38T tank. It's like, wait a minute, hold on. You know, that doesn't make any sense. You know, another issue is the territories and stuff. You know, I mean, there are historical scenarios, but you also can just play the game by putting down territories because the territories, there's no map in this. The territories are, are cards. Um, so you could have, technically speaking, if you wanted to, when you were setting up your cards, you could put Minsk or Smolensk in front of Minsk. Uh, yeah, no, okay. That's just, um, yeah. Another issue, quite frankly, and I'll be honest with you, I pledged at a pretty high tier on this, $100. But if I'm pledging $100, and this is the rule book I get, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm feeling a little upset. It's not even put together. And, I mean, take a look at how the sequence of play is done here. Look at this. There's arrows. You know, it's just like, for $100 of my money, I mean, why the designer of this game didn't take a look at some good rule books from different war games, I don't know. But I really, really, this is just, you know, this was, this, this is a hot mess. Look at this, you have to follow. Now granted, there's some color, which helps. The original version, because I got the, the beta deck, at the level I pledged at, the test deck, was just black and white. But, <sighs> oh my. And the cards, the quality of the cards is not the best in the world either. Um, they're a little flimsy, quite frankly, uh, as well. So, I mean, kind of like when you shuffle them. You know, this is, see, it's kind of hard to put them together when you shuffle them. I'll let you hear that again. So I'm going to show you a contrast here in a second. But see, now contrast that with these are GMT's cards from No Retreat, the Russian Front. Just give a listen. Hear that? See how well they went together? Two? Hear the difference? Okay. It's just, it's a much better quality. And again, for a hundred bucks, I'd expect a better quality, especially since the whole card is, is it's card based. It's a deck builder. So, um, yeah, and I, and I had a lot of feedback ideas too for the beta deck and stuff um, the designer mentioned, but then he kind of, well, he kind of disappeared. And, you know, he was going to put a thread on Board Game Geek and stuff like that. So, suggestions, which one of my suggestions was to fix the rule book. That just never happened because he never set all those things up. So, um, and, and again, it's just the comparing things, you know, the values and stuff. It's not clear, you know, how many units you can have in any given space. Uh, it, it misses the whole element of combined arms, which gave the Germans such a huge advantage at the beginning of the war. You know, like if you read Barbarossa Unleashed by Craig Luther, or you look at books by Glantz, um, you know, that, that, that combined arms, that integration, was such a huge thing for the Germans at the beginning of the war, which the Russians had to learn, and really, quite frankly, didn't learn, until, you know, late 1943, if you really want to argue about it. I guess you could debate it and say it was earlier in 43, but it definitely was 1943, a couple of years before they learned it and stuff. That doesn't show up here, you know, in this. There's no... It just, it just, it just doesn't. In my opinion... I mean, this isn't as bad as Strike the Bear. Strike the Bear is, oh, good Lord. Whew, I mean, let's put it this way. If somebody were to come up to me and be like, Tim, if you played Strike the Bear, what do you think? I'd go, bah, 
because it's just, you know, I'd be like, doo, doo, you know, I'd, I'd be like, no, stay away, stay away. I wouldn't go so far with this, but this, quite frankly, this is quite frankly, just doesn't work as a deck building game as representing the Eastern Front. It just, it just doesn't. And I know, and I know, in all fairness, it is hard to make a war game that is a deck builder that is extremely difficult to do. The only successful one I've really seen and played is Hands in the Sea. But, yeah, it's just, I had high hopes for this game. And it's just, it's, it's just been very disappointing. Um, yeah. So this was the worst game to me because I, I played this, I tried this a couple times. I played this with my wife who likes deck builders. And, but she's not a war gamer to be honest. But, you know, she plays, like, Twilight Struggle and stuff like that. And she was just like, no, I'm, I won't play this again with you. I was like, oh, okay. But, and she plays Legendary with me, too. Um, to give you an idea, again, about deck builders and stuff. So, this was this was my worst game to me this year. It's just, it just finally came out. Um, I got this Saturday before Christmas. So, like, a week ago, uh, I got this. And, yeah, it's just... I, I'm, I, some people may enjoy this, but I just don't think it represents the Eastern Front very well. And I'm just kind of, I feel like, you know, just saying buyer beware because, you know, like I said, between the rule book, which, again, I mean, this is the rule book. I mean, yeah. I just, this, this is actually the nicest part of the rule book right here, to be honest. And the print's so tiny. You know, most of your Wargamer people are going to be, you know, in my age group. You know, the 35 plus block. So, yeah. So, I would just say, kind of do your homework on this if you're thinking about picking this up. Uh, I don't know if this, how far this will go from Kickstarter. But, um, yeah. Just, uh, just consider and take a look at things carefully. And again, you know, your mileage may vary in the end. But to me, it's just... There are so many other games out there to play. And so many games on the Eastern Front that are so much better that I just... I don't think I will ever play this again. I almost... I almost played it the other day. And I went back to the rule book and started reading the rule book again. And I was just like, no, I just... I just... I just can't. I just... I mean, war is not chess. War has friction. Clausewitz. You know, it's just, you can't sum it down to just, you know, a ratio. And then you either damage or you eliminate it or there's no effect. It's just, I'm sorry, it takes away the element of, of luck from it. So, yeah. So, the Panzer Attack was definitely the worst to me game of 2018. So there you have it. My best and my worst of 2018. So this is the last video for this year. So I will see you all on the flip side in 2019. And again, I hope my intention is for my first video of 2019 to be Pacific Tide to be published by Compass Games. So that's what I'm hoping. As soon as I get it, I'm going to be tearing into it. As soon as I get my shipping notice, I'm going to read the rule book online, which, by the way, is posted online. It's under the files in Board Game Geek. You know, if you're looking at that or, you know, you're interested now um, from watching my video here, take a look at it. So, sorry this ran a little bit long, but this is kind of like the summation of the year, if you will. So, this is Tim Korchnoy from Bare Bones Wargaming, wishing you all a happy new year and good gaming. And we'll see you out in the Pacific Theater. Once again, the epic clash between the Japanese and the United States, the IJN and the USN. Which again, and I've mentioned this before in some of my other videos, it just blows my mind that I never really thought about it. There was only five major carrier versus carrier battles in the entire war. That just... <clears throat> I just blew my mind when I was reading um, Black Shoe Carrier Admiral early this year about um, Frank Jack Fletcher, which is a very good book, by the way. Um, I just never thought about it because, you know, there's so much emphasis put on it and you just think about, you know, oh, the carrier warfare, the carrier was revolutionary. Yeah, there was only five heads-up fights. And 
four of them were extremely intense. You know, Coral Sea, Midway, Eastern Solomon, Santa Cruz, all those in 1942, and the only other one was really the Philippine Sea. That's just, that's just, that's, yeah, <laughs> mind-blowing. So, but anyway, that's where I will see you again in the new year, is out there in the Pacific Theater. So, as always, thanks for watching, and we'll see you next time.